Welcome, everyone. Today, we are going to take a look at a decision from Germany again. And this is a case where the focus is placed on the issue of um, willingness on the side of the implementer, particularly looking at what type of behavior can be expected from an implementer after there have been a notification that uh, there is infringement of SEPs and the license needs to be taken. This is the focus of the decision, but apart from that, some other interesting topics are covered as well. One is um, the conditions or the requirements uh, under which a potential abuse of market dominance can occur with respect to filing and actions filed uh, based on SEPs. And um, also, there is uh, some. There are some interesting remarks of the court regarding the non-discrimination issue. And finally, there is also some um, remarks of. There are also some remarks of the court regarding um, the extent of an obligation to disclose documents in uh, front proceedings in Germany, especially uh, especially agreements with third parties which uh, have already been signed. So this is what we're going to talk about today. The decision is a decision of the District Court of Munich, which was delivered in February this year. And the claimant here is um, GE, which is um, also here a member of the so-called Access Advance pool, which is a pool um, covering patents, uh, standard essential patents, um, especially with respect to the HEVC standard. So we are here talking about uh, codec and not um, wireless standards. The defendant, on the other hand, is TCL. Before we go into the legal part, let's take a look, as always, at um, the story behind the case. The, as we're going to see in a moment, the most part of the discussions um, between the parties or the negotiations between the parties were led between the pool, the Access Advance pool and TCL. There were also bilateral discussions between the patent owner GE that had filed the action here and TCL, but that happened at some later stage of um, um, the case, especially after the proceeding started. So most of the discussions were um, within uh, between the pool and TCL. And the first contact was already back in May 2016, that is more than seven years ago. There, uh, Access Advance contacted TCL and informed about the portfolio and um, offered discussions and negotiations um, for a license agreement. Initially, there were some uh, communications between the parties, which, uh, however, did not move very fast. Uh, there was um, uh, no agreement signed. Then um, in 2018, Access Advanced um, shared claim charts with TCL. What was interesting here is that uh, this was um, also a bit difficult because it took seven attempts uh, to send the claims charts over to TCL. And we're also going to see um, later on that this was something noted by the court. And apart from that, um, there was also a meeting in person with um, a representative of TCL. And during this meeting, the TCL representative informed uh, Access Advance that they were speaking only for the TV branch of the TCL group, not for the smartphone and tablet branch. And this was a different company, but they did not name which company this was. So Access Advance had to um, identify the company and also start a, a separate line of discussions with them as well. In uh, July 2021, then uh, Access Advance made, uh, sorry, in March 2020, Access Advance uh, provided uh, the standard license agreement of the pool to TCL uh, and uh, sent again uh, 24 claim, 25 claim charts. But at that stage, um, there was no agreement between the parties. So um, there were further discussions uh, going on. In early 2021, then um, TCL and both branches, the smartphone and the TV branch, 
um, basically said that they would need more time to assess the information they had received so far and especially they also mentioned that they would need more time to work with the claim charts uh, that they have not been uh, through the claim charts uh, yet so shortly after that um, GE brought the present infringement action against TCL before the Munich District Court so this was the stage uh, basically the years before uh, the proceedings started. Uh, after the proceedings started, um, TCL um, had been a little bit more cooperative and as we're going to see, um, it made also um, to, to counter offers to, to the pool. Um, before that, the pool um, made another offer to uh, TCL, both for the smartphone and the TV branch, which was on, um, let's say, lower, better terms than the uh, standard agreement that has been provided in the past. This was not accepted. In October 2021, TCL made a counter offer, which um, was also rejected by Access Advance. What happened also almost uh, at the same time was that in the proceedings, Access Advance provided um, TCL with access to third-party agreements over a data room that has been established uh, for this reason. Initially, they provided uh, 43 agreements in this data room out of uh, almost um, 216 total, and then um, more agreements were added. So at the end, there were 61 agreements offered to TCL um, for review. Almost at the same time, uh, TCL's uh, attorneys in the proceedings wrote um, a letter to GE and asked GE also for a bilateral license agreement uh, offer. So this was then the start where um, also GE was involved as the patent holder in the negotiations and there was, let's say, this second layer in the negotiations between um, GE and TCL. In the following, um, there were further offers sent by Access Advance. There was an offer in March 2022, which covered both the smartphone and the TV branches of TCL. And um, there was um, an amended offer a, a month later, which was then on a lump sum payment following a request um, of TCL, but this offer was not accepted as well. At the same time, GE made also a bilateral license offer to TCL, which um, was not uh, did not lead to an agreement either. What was interesting here and um, also played a role in the decision later on was that um, re regarding the offers that were at the table in uh, the spring of 2022, uh, an offer by the pool and also the bilateral offer by GE, TCL responded only to the first of them. So it made a counter offer only to the pool. A counter offer to GE was not made uh, at all by TCL. So this um, was the status um, during the proceedings, which were concluded with the decision of the court in February 2023, which um, found in favor of GE, of the patent owner here, and among the other remedies, uh, the, um, um, the the recall and destruction of infringing products, etc., also an injunction was granted against TCL. Now we have not been able to um, identify whether this case has been appealed, but of course we will um, monitor the the case law, and if there is a, an appeal decision in these proceedings, we will uh, include this include this, of course, in our in our webinars here. So this was the story, and uh, now let's take a look at the uh, at the legal findings of the court of the, uh, the most important um, uh, remarks which the court made uh, in this case. The TCL uh, raised, of course, a front defense here, and in Germany, this front defense is um, predominantly based on a competition law um, on a competition law angle. So what the courts um, ex regularly um, examine here is whether through filing um, the, the action which is directed into uh, an injunction or uh, the recall and destruction of infringing products, basically to claims that can exclude the implementer from the market, whether uh, this um, would constitute an abuse 
of market dominance on the side of the of the SCP holder, and if this is the case, then an injunction or other exclusionary measures should not be granted. So this is what the court in Munich had to um, also examine here. The first thing you need to um, clarify here is whether there is a market dominant position on the side of the patent owner. In the present case, uh, the court assumed that there was a market dominant position, although this was something that was contested um, between the parties, but the court just assumed that mainly because um, it found that um, very clearly there was no abuse of a potential market dominant position here. So the court said here an abuse is given if there is a request to have access to an invention uh, which is patented and the SCP owner either denies this requested access, so does not want to grant the license at all, or offers access at uh, unreasonable conditions. And um, it is important also to add here that an abuse is there if this unreasonable, if the SCP owner um, is not willing to depart from this unreasonable condition until the end of the negotiations. According to the court, this means that a, a non-front offer, which is uh, made during the negotiations, maybe in, uh, at the early stage or even later on, does not per se mean that there is an abuse of uh, market dominant behavior here. So this this um, refusal to grant access to reasonable conditions needs to be there uh, even at the end of the negotiations. In the eyes of the court, this was uh, not the case here. The court found that uh, there was no abuse of market dominance on the side of um, GE because mainly uh, it found that um, TCL had not been sufficiently willing in the negotiations with the pool, of course, but also with GE. And this missing willingness was there both before and during the trial. So this was um, the, the court's uh, thinking regarding this um, uh, potential uh, abuse of market dominance by, by GE, by the SCP owner here. And then, of course, the main um, part of the decision focused on exactly this issue or the issue of willingness on the side of TCL. Now generally here uh, the court did not um, apply uh, something new, did not apply a new standard, it uh, applied the standard that uh, the Federal Court of Justice, which is the highest court in Germany, has set in 2020 in the Sisvel Higher cases which um, has, let's say, two, two elements. One element is that um, on the implementer side, a clear and unambiguous declaration of willingness is required on the one hand, and additionally, the implementer is expected to show a target-oriented engagement in the negotiations with the uh, patent owner. So this is the general framework which the court followed here as well. But uh, in, in light of that, it made several uh, remarks or clar clarifications, which uh, are very interesting. The first one was to say that this um, request to sign a license on the side of uh, the implementer or the willingness on the side of the implementer must be continuous, meaning that um, there should be a real interest into obtaining a license and um, this uh, interest should be there throughout the negotiations of the parties. The court linked this uh, requirement also to the question of the abuse of uh, potential of, of a market dominant position, arguing basically that if such a willingness is missing or a, a sincere request to sign a license is not there, then basically an abusive behavior on the side of the SCP owner is also regularly excluded. Because in order to be um, uh, to be abusive, uh, you need to have on the other side someone who is actually willing to engage and to take a license. If this is not the case, then um, it does not play as much of a role um, what the patent owner um, is doing himself. So this was um, uh, an element which the court highlighted here. As uh, other courts have said, um, 
when you are looking at the uh, willingness uh, of an of an implementer you have always to have a case by case assessment uh, based on objective criteria or from an objective viewpoint this means that um, you have to consider the circumstances of each individual case and how the parties have acted in the specific uh, in the specific scenario meaning that you cannot have for example let's say um, deadlines which apply to everyone when a response should be there etc it's basically needed to uh, take a look at the circumstances of each individual case separately what the court said here is that um, in order to to look whether there has been willingness or not, um, there is mainly one question that um, you should answer. And this is uh, the question of what would a reasonable party which is interested into uh, reaching a negotiation outcome that serves the mutual interest do in the specific stage of uh, discussions in order to promote this goal, again, considering the specificalities of the individual case. So what the court should do was basically to look at what could be expected by a party which uh, is indeed interested into signing a license in the specific case um, uh, between the specific um, or similarly situated parties, uh, considering the way the parties have already behaved so far, and then compare that to the actual behavior of the implementer. And if there are discrepancies between them, uh, then of course um, it's very likely that uh, there is a lack of willingness on the side of the implementer. Apart from that, some other general comments which were um, uh, interesting here was the clarification of the court that willingness includes also a duty to promote negotiations meaning that it's not just about um, sitting together or joining meetings or, or discussing, basically. Um, there is a need also to work in a way which um, can lead the negotiations to a conclusion. The court said here that this duty to promote negotiation uh, is triggered uh, every time when during the negotiations, it can be expected from a party, from the implementer particularly here, to make the, the next step, to take the next step. And um, how, to, um, uh, how to assess that? Uh, you have to look at the uh, usual business practice and also the principle of good faith. Meaning again that uh, you don't fulfill your obligation to act as a willing licensee by just taking part in discussions, but you have, uh, for example, we're going to see that also more in detail in a moment, um, take the information that has been provided, um, progress, process this information and um, let's say make suggestions based on that, uh, so offer changes, etc. So this is a duty to promote negotiations, which is part of uh, being considered a willing licensee. Apart from that, if there is a offer on the side of the SEP owner, the court also said here that there is a duty of the implementer to react to this um, offer, which also includes a duty to raise all concerns uh, against the offer at once, meaning um, not waiting for uh, to, to raise concerns later on, especially waiting to raise concerns uh, if litigation starts at a later point in time. And this duty to react is regularly given. So um, irrespective of whether the offer is perfectly front or not, there is one exception when there is no duty to react. And this is um, these are cases where um, the SEP owner's offer is absolutely unacceptable. Meaning uh, here, this is a, a high threshold, uh, cases in which the offer is um, so bad or so um, far away from the front range or, or the front threshold that you cannot really see uh, a seriously meant offer in this, um, in this offer of the SCP owner. In this case, uh, then it is allowed or it's, it's acceptable that uh, the implementer does not react at all, but Apart from these extreme cases, regularly um, the implementer is um, obliged to react to an offer by the SEP owner. And this goes back, of course, to this requirement to engage in a target-oriented manner in the negotiations because 
if you would expect uh, to react only when the perfect front offer is there, then uh, of course negotiations could not uh, could not move forward. Then the court also made a point regarding a, an issue which um, uh, is often encountered in um, front cases and was also an issue here. And it's the question of um, how to deal with cases where the implementer at an early stage has been unwilling, but uh, at a later point in time had a change in a change of mind and um, actually was interested into uh, getting a license and moved constructively to this uh, to this uh, to this end. Is this something that can be considered or um, is this something which is irrelevant? And the court said basically uh, the missing willingness can be compensated at a later point in time. However, you have always to look at the specific circumstances of the case and especially how um, the implementer behaved before or how let's say strong the um, unwillingness was before and um, for example in the present case as we're going to see in a moment the court found that uh, TCL was not able to compensate its initially unwilling behavior um, later on during the, the court proceedings. Finally one element here which is also interesting more from uh, let's say procedural side the court said that if um, the unwillingness of the implementer is established, then the court is not going to or should not um, examine the offer of the SAP owner in detail uh, and whether it's front conform or not. This is something that uh, again was established by the Federal Court of Justice uh, in the civil higher cases and was adopted by the District Court of Uni here meaning that um, if there is a finding of, uh, of a lack of willingness on the side of the implementer, there is uh, no need for the court to uh, examine every detail of the, of the SCP owner's offer and um, also reach the conclusion of that this offer has been front. And this is something which the court did also here. It did not go into the details of the offers that have been made to TCL. And now let's take a look at the assessment, the specific assessment of the court here. So as we have said already, the conclusion, the overall conclusion was that TCL was not sufficiently willing. And this was both before and after the action was filed. The court uh, here took um, into account the entire conduct of TCL and the entire conduct both towards the access advance pool and also towards um, GE. So uh, it considered how uh, TCL had behaved both um, towards the pool mainly before uh, the proceeding started, but also towards GE after the proceeding started. The general sentiment of the court here was that uh, TCL applied delaying tactics. The court um, found that uh, TCL's goal was to impose its own financial licensing conditions and that it had um, intended to use the patent without authorization and payment of fees for as long as possible, uh, basically in order to uh, to create pressure to on the patent owner side. What the court also mentioned here, and this is, uh, I think, an interesting point, is that um, this unwillingness of TCL is also shown by the fact that um, although it got access to third-party comparable agreements and um, had argued in the proceedings that uh, competitors or other similarly situated licensees had gotten a better deal, at no point in time had it um, demonstrated uh, from an objective viewpoint a willingness to take a license on these allegedly better terms which um, were signed by its competitors. And this is um, an interesting view here because this, the court um, basically said if you are um, complaining or if you are arguing that the offers uh, you got were not good enough uh, or not good enough or, or so good as the offers that uh, or, or the deals that other competitors have gotten, then it is at least um, uh, expected that you would be willing to accept the terms that you think are better. Uh, and if you, uh, with your behavior, do not show that, then this can be um, also 
an indication that uh, you're basically unwilling in general to take a license. And this is something which uh, the court saw this way here um, in the present case. Then uh, the court also mentioned here that some of the critics uh, criticisms which TCL had um, raised with respect to the pool licensing conditions did not justify um, its behavior and did not make its behavior less um, less unwilling or willing. There were basically two elements which um, TCL had um, uh, raised with respect to the pool um, to the pool licensing terms. Expect of the um, uh, of the topic of um, discrimination, which we're going to take a look at in a moment. It basically um, said that um, one one element was um, the so-called duplicate royalty policy, which the standard terms of access advance um, um, included. And this is um, going back to an, another decision in parallel proceedings led by access advance in Germany in Düsseldorf where the Düsseldorf court had found that um, this um, duplicate royalty policy, which is part of the standard terms of the access advance pool, was not France because it did not contain sufficient safeguards to make sure that um, an implementer who has licensed uh, patents through the access advance pool, but uh, eventually the same patents also through another pool, will not make double payments for uh, for these patents that as, as long as there is an overlap between the different pools. And uh, this was also an argument raised here by TCL um, against the offers by Access Advance. But the court said um, this uh, argument did not really uh, convince here because TCL did not show that it had um, already licensed relevant patents otherwise. So even if this provision would not be sufficient, um, factually there was no real issue here because um, TCL had not licensed any patents which are included in the access advance pool. So this was not a, a significant issue here. The second element was um, TCL's argument that the pool administration fees are very high and which makes then uh, the offer on front. And um, here um, the court did not go into the merits to examine that. And the main reason for that was that this was raised at a very late stage of the proceedings. So this was raised uh, almost after six and a half years uh, after the, um, uh, the terms were delivered to TCL. And the court said here um, that it was not warranted to stop the decision um, of the court shortly before it would be delivered and reopen, let's say, evidence on this topic because um, this would just cause further delay. So this was again something which the court did not um, uh, see that it could change its uh, view regarding the, the, the finding that TCL had acted as an unwilling licensee. Now, uh, to be more, um, to look at more at the behavior which the court uh, criticized on the side of TCL. Before litigation, um, the court uh, focused on um, on several aspects, especially the um, the reaction of um, TCL to communications by the Access Advance Pool. So we have seen in the beginning um, there was um, the notice of infringement and some discussions. Um, took place but um, shortly after that after this initial contact TCL was uh, more or less silent for um, a period of time so uh, the court mentioned here um, as uh, as a potential as as an as an indication of unwillingness the fact that after this initial contact TCL did not react at all to 10 emails and nine letters sent by the pool to um, different companies of the TCL group. So this was um, one um, element the court criticized. Then um, another element which the court um, criticized as well was the fact that Access Advance tried to provide claim charts to uh, TCL, but delivery of the claim charts um, failed seven times due to technical problems at TCL. So the court was also looking at that as a potential 
um, way just to delay uh, negotiations and mentioned this uh, with respect to the assessment of willingness uh, before the start of the proceedings. Then uh, the other element which the court mentioned was the fact that um, after the, there was this first meeting and um, TCL informed the pool that um, the specific representative was not just speaking for the TV branch and not for the smartphone and tablet branch of uh, TCL. It was not mentioned which is the company within the TCL group which is responsible for the smartphones and um, tablets. And this was mentioned also by the court here as something uh, which um, indicates unwillingness or an intention to delay. And of course, uh, the last element which the court uh, noted here was the fact that both uh, TCL uh, branches, the, the smartphone branch and the TV branch, did not review or did not examine uh, the claim charts received months after they received. Uh, so here the court also uh, saw an, in, uh, an indication of unwillingness. Then uh, during the proceedings, the question here was, um, did the things which TCL undertook during the proceedings, did they compensate its previous unwillingness before the start of the trial? And the court um, in general said uh, no, because it found that TCL acted too late and engaged too little in general. There were here two elements which the court um, highlighted. The first one was um, uh, the, the constant requests for further information that TCL uh, raised during the negotiations. The court said, uh, of course, when we're talking about front licensing, it's not prohibited to ask questions or it's not prohibited to, uh, to uh, request information. But the court said this can be problematic if, uh, th uh, if such requests are repeated very often and after many years of negotiations. And especially it can be problematic when the information received is not be, has not been processed and has not been used um, in order to progress the negotiations. And in the eyes of the court, this was something that had happened here in the present case. The court mentioned some examples. Um, first example was that um, TCL did not use the data on the comparable licenses that it had gotten through the data room, which um, uh, the Access Advance pool had established in order to provide concrete feedback on licensing terms. So what the court would have expected here is uh, that uh, TCL would look at the agreements, look at the specific terms, and then come back to the pool with specific uh, proposals on how to change uh, things, how to change licensing terms, add or um, um, amend, etc. But this did not happen. So here um, the court said uh, requesting further and further information on the comparable licenses without um, really this being mirrored in proposals regarding the terms is, is something which is problematic. Then what um, the court also mentioned here was a motion which uh, TCL filed during the proceedings. And it was a motion um, requesting the court to order the disclosure of non-redacted version of the comparable agreements that had been um, offered to TCL. So there were some reductions in the agreements that uh, sh were shared with TCL, the comparable agreements. So um, TCL requested um, to have access to the full agreements without reductions, but the court uh, said that um, uh, this was something that was um, filed approximately 10 months after access was granted to the license agreements. And this was a, a request for additional information which um, did not really make sense, not least because it was um, filed so late after uh, the information was received. So this was something that the court also um, uh, criticized here. And um, what was also criticized by the court uh, was the request filed by TCL, uh, also with, um, with a specific motion towards the court, as we're going to see in a while, to disclose the internal pool agreement um, of Access Advance with the individual SCP owners that are part of the pool. So the court um, saw here again a request to have additional information, but was not really convinced what was 
what would be the relevant of uh, the information contained contained in the internal pool agreement for um, for the case here or to TCL. So this was also seen as um, a potential attempt here to delay things. The second element at which uh, the court then looked at um, for uh, in the phase after the proceedings had started were the counter offers which TCL made. And uh, the principle uh, behind that is basically to say that, of course, if an implementer makes a counter offer, it uh, makes clear that it is prepared to take a license on the terms that uh, are contained in the counter offer. So this is something that could indicate um, the general willingness to obtain a front license and to um, to negotiate with the with the patent owner. Uh, so this was something that um, needed to be examined here, whether you can extract, let's say, willingness out of these counter offers. Of course, this applied only towards um, the pool because, as we have seen, a TCL had not made a counter offer uh, to GE after it had uh, received the bilateral offer of GE. So it was only about um, here whether the uh, offers, the counter offers of TCL towards the pool, could have this effect that um, they could contribute to consider TCL as a willing licensee here. But the court found that this was not the case. And uh, it had uh, concerns both in terms of timing, but also in terms of content. So in terms of timing, the uh, timing, the court mentioned here that the first counter offer was made after almost one and a half years. So this seems to be quite a lot of time um, if uh, for someone who is actually interested into signing and taking a license. Apart from that, the court also found that uh, in terms of content, the conditions which were included in the counter offer, the first counter offer, were impossible to be accepted by the pool, both structurally and legally. What does this mean? Uh, the court basically saw that uh, the royalties for future sales, which um, TCL counter offered, were so low that if the pool had accepted to license TCL on this very, very low terms, then uh, it would likely violate its own internal bylaws and the agreements that it had signed with uh, with the SCP owners. So this was something that the co uh, the pool would not do. And of course, um, this also meant that um, you could not expect the pool to agree uh, to this uh, counter offer. Then uh, the court in this context, it uh, mentioned also as, as a sign of unwillingness, the fact that the amended counter offer, which came shortly before the end of the proceedings, had no substantial improvement regarding the uh, this uh, this this um, this part. So here the court also said um, uh, the terms were were very low and um, were not also improved in the second counter offer. So this indicated again a missing willingness um, and a rather an interest to to delay things. Then finally, the court also uh, found here that uh, in any case, TCL was not entitled to the conditions which uh, were in, uh, included in the counter offers, not least because these terms would conflict with the disclosed comparable licenses, meaning that they would be very different from the terms that other similarly situated licensees and competitors of TCL have, have, have signed. So uh, therefore, there was no claim, uh, TCL could not claim basically to be granted these terms. So offering these terms uh, again um, uh, was, not, was not justified. So having said that, the court then um, had this um, looked at the SCP owner's offer, not in detail as we have said already, but um, only with regard to this question, which is linked um, to the assessment of willingness of whether the offer had been um, absolutely unacceptable or not. And uh, here it took um, consideration of both the offers of Access Advance, but also the offer of GE. Again, this is uh, not a, a full assessment of the front conformity of the offers. It's just a um, an assessment of whether uh, they have been extremely unfront or extremely uh, uh, outside of the front frame. So, um, with the consequence that the assessment of the willingness of uh, TCL should have been different here. Um, but um, the court 
found that uh, this was not the case. It uh, found of uh, it said of course that the SCP owner uh, must be willing to offer front terms and um, that it's in general unacceptable to offer and insist on arbitrary or discriminatory conditions. But it did not find that um, any of um, these extreme conditions or extremely unfront conditions were included in the offers uh, that uh, TCL had received by both the pool and the SCP owner here. The main um, issue here was um, uh, the issue of non-discrimination. And this goes back to TCL's uh, arguments, which uh, revolved a lot, a, lot, a lot around this topic basically um, saying that um, it got offers which were they could match the offers that others had gotten and were very much much worse than the terms that um, other competitors had uh, had signed so the court um, uh, took a look at that and uh, made some clarifications in this respect it said basically a discrimination um, can occur and this uh, is the case when you treat equals unequally or unequals equally without justification. So this is the case. Um, if this happens, then uh, you have a discrimination and uh, the terms offered are, uh, are, are not acceptable. If we are in a litigation context, however, the court said here, whether this is the case or not, is something that the implementer must show and establish in the proceedings. So this is the duty of the implementer to um, show that the that the offer has been um, discriminatory, not uh, something which um, at first is uh, an obligation of the patent owner. So here in the present case, it was on TCL to show that the offers uh, of the pool and GE were not um, were discriminatory, and for that it should have provided at least plausible indications. But in the eyes of the court, this had not um, taken place here. So uh, TCL failed to do that. The court um, looked at um, different aspects here. And um, one of the aspects was um, based on the same notion that we have seen before, that um, a willing implementer should basically be um, one who is willing to at least sign the terms that um, its competitors have signed. And here the court said um, in the present case, um, uh, there was no discrimination of, uh, against TCL. TCL had claimed basically that um, some of its competitors or some of its uh, of, of similarly situated licensees had gotten better terms regarding the treatment of past sales, uh, discounts, uh, or um, not paying at all for past sales, and that uh, the, the offers by um, uh, Access Advance especially were um, not so good um, um, in this regard. And uh, that's why TCL felt uh, that it, would, it was discriminated against its competitors. But the court said here, um, there can be no discrimination through different uh, for different treatment of past sales if the implementer is prepared to sign a license on the allegedly better conditions. And this were uh, this was something that was basically possible here to TCL because uh, Access Advance had indicated also in the proceedings that it was willing to uh, discuss this point and uh, adapt its offer in this regard. So the court said here, uh, you cannot claim on the one hand uh, discrimination and on the other hand, uh, do not also accept to get um, the same deal as uh, as your competitors if this is something that the patent owner or, or the pool in the present case here is, uh, is prepared to do. Then a second point, which um, I think is also interesting here, was the finding of the court that you cannot basically establish discrimination based on comparable licenses which have been signed without litigation. So what's, what was here uh, the background um, on this? Basically, um, TCL looked at, this, at some uh, other agreements which competitors had signed uh, on different terms and agreements, however, which were signed without recourse to litigation first. So the people, uh, the, the parties actually negotiated 
and um, as a result of these negotiations without litigation an agreement was signed and TCL took reference to these terms to say that um, the, the terms offered to me now uh, are different and discriminating. The court said here uh, you need to take into account the higher cost and risk which is attached to litigation on, for, for the SCP owner and this higher cost and risk justify at least to, to a proper extent um, a differentiation in the terms. So um, if you are already in litigation and uh, you have not managed to sign an agreement before litigation without recourse to litigation, then you cannot go back and argue that agreements that have been signed without um, without a trial uh, are uh, have better terms and you're being discriminated against. So this is a point which um, is interesting and um, uh, pay, would play a, a significant role here when it comes to uh, assessing non-discrimination based on comparable license agreements. And the final point here, which uh, the court also um, uh, also dealt with, was whether there is discrimination because, um, according to TCL, the effective license burden, which um, um, would uh, occur from the offers it had received, would be higher than uh, the effective license burden of comparable agreements. TCL also argued here that um, the pool had acted in a discriminatory way because it had not explained why there were differences in this effective license burden between the offers uh, it received and the comparables that others had signed. But the court here uh, was not convinced by that. It found that this effective license burden is just a mathematical factor and it's not actual part of the agreements and uh, the obligation uh, there is no obligation also of the SCP owner to um, to explain this difference because basically uh, the value that needs to be compared is derived from the comparable licenses and this is something um, which uh, as we have seen uh, the implementer should um, do extract and also plead in the proceedings and finally one element here uh, regarding uh, which is related to the comparable agreements but also to, uh, to other type of uh, relevant documents in, in front trials there was a motion as we've said um, of tcl in the proceedings to order the disclosure of all agreements of the pool with third parties and uh, the internal pool agreement so as uh, if we remember, uh, TCL had gotten access to the data room, had gotten access to in total uh, more than 60 agreements, but it wanted to get access to all la uh, agreements signed by Access Advance, which were uh, some uh, approximately 260 agreements. And it wanted also to have access to the pool, to the agreement between the pool and the SCP owners that have joined the pool. And the court dismissed this motion because um, it found that um, TCL was not in a position to claim this uh, type of uh, disclosure. Regarding the comparable third party agreements, the court said that there is no claim to access these agreements. Why? Because um, as a rule, if there is a claim, this the claim refers only to uh, those licenses which are relevant uh, to the specific license C and these are licenses covering the same product category or uh, the same market. So not every agreement signed uh, is relevant and therefore the claim to have access to this information and of course to request the production and disclo the disclosure of uh, the relevant agreement um, is limited to, the, to, to only to relevant, um, to relevant agreements. More or less the same uh, was uh, the answer of the court also regarding the internal pool agreements. It found that they are not relevant um, in this case here, especially they're not relevant to assess the question of discrimination. So here the court also denied that based on this um, criterion of, of, of the relevance. Finally, the court added here that there is no need to disclose documents, um, especially in the present case here, because TCL had acted as an unwilling licensee. And um, this means, uh, the court said, um, 
even if you would have um, produced all of this extra information to TCL, there is no indication that uh, this unwilling behavior that it had shown so far would cease. So uh, this was an additional factor um, uh, speaking in favor of uh, denying this motion here and um, just including further information, further agreements in the proceedings, which um, uh, also were not relevant for, for deciding the case here. The court, on the contrary, saw in this motion rather an intent uh, to cause a further delay, not least because it was filed relatively late um, in the proceedings. So this has been all for today. I hope that you found the presentation interesting and have now a better understanding of the ruling. A summary of this decision and of course other court decisions which are related to standard essential patents are available at the case law section at 4 Epic Council's website. We always value your feedback, so please feel free to share any comments or suggestions on our platform through social media or per email at info at 4 Thank you for listening and see you again next time. <laughs>